Hello, I'm from the government, yes. Um, so we were on this stage last year, and we were kind of giving you the overview for a very exciting thing that's happening inside the federal government. Currently, there are two uh, lean startups inside the federal government, believe it or not. Uh, one is called the United States Digital Service, the USDS. The other is called 18F. Those two things and a handful of other teams that are all working together uh, make up something that we've started calling the Digital Coalition. And the Digital Coalition exists primarily to really be driving government forward. Uh, we're thinking about you know, classical patterns of disruption, stuff that all of you, I'm sure, are doing or at least thinking about, and bringing those inside the government, arming people in, inside agencies uh, with each of these teams, working with folks on the ground already in those agencies to help them really really kind of reset their expectations for how software, uh, how government software, how government services can be delivered. Um, I mentioned we were here a year ago. We kind of gave you the lay of the land. You can search YouTube for that video. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much about that, because what I really want to do is uh, give you time to kind of understand what we've been doing over the last, three, over the last year. Um, We've got three really awesome women who are here today to kind of give you three case studies of things we've shipped over the last year uh, inside the Veterans Administration, inside the uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service, and uh, with the Federal Election Commission. So again, just sort of a, a broad overview, USDS, 18F, this digital coalition, we work together. Uh, USDS is inside the White House. They uh, are essentially kind of, they're able to provide air cover. They're able to dive into, uh, you know, maybe the, the burning buildings, if you will. So think about the projects that might have, uh, have you know, a high, high impact uh, according to the administration. So things that the, the president and his team have identified, things like healthcare, immigration, the VA, education. They are on the ground helping those agencies get projects back on track. 18F, we are sort of the, I think, the, 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 the foundation of the coalition. We're a team that has grown from about 15 people 18 or 19 months ago to currently 160 people, yes, inside the government, 10x growth in 18 months. Um, we have team, our biggest team is in DC. We have a small team, a smaller team, about 30 people here in San Francisco. And then we've got small teams in Chicago, New York, Austin, Portland, Dayton, Ohio, folks teleworking all across the country. So we're a distributed team that essentially acts as a consultancy. Uh, we are here to help agencies solve problems. They come to us with ideas, with projects, with product ideas, and you know, we help them get them on the right track. We either become their product team, we be, you know, put a product manager, a designer, a developer, a team on that project, or we kind of become a consulting team. Uh, and I'm really excited because I think two or three folks that were at this conference last year are now either Presidential Innovation Fellows or work for 18F. So uh, I'm proud to say that, that the presentation last year worked, and we hope we get to chat with more of you today. Um, but without further ado, first up is Emily Wright Moore from the Veterans Administration to tell you about the work that uh, she's been doing on a little website called vets.gov. Hi. My name is Emily. Um, I am an employee of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I am part of the United States Digital Service. Um, we are a very small but mighty team trying to tackle some very large challenges that I'm sure you have heard of on the news, so we won't go too far into that. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce you to Lizzie. Lizzie is an Army veteran. She's also a single mother. She also went to college and used the GI Bill to pay for her school. At some point, Lizzie moved houses. She changed her address, a thing we all do. Um, she went online to try and change her address, but she wasn't able to find a place that she could do this. She went to many 1990s looking websites and there was absolutely no location for her to enter her new address. There was no phone number to call, or there were too many phone numbers to call. That could also be the problem. So why this happens at agencies like the VA is that we, actually just have a lot of websites, and we have a lot of places that we may store your address. Currently, the count is 1,427 websites, and over 45 places we may store a veteran's address. 
So this is really tough for people like Lizzie, who actually didn't, wasn't able to change her address. Her loans went into default, and she started to, it started to affect her credit score. This should never happen. We owe these people critical services, and we can't let them down. So this, this is a problem I'm sure we can all, I'm sure we can all agree on. Um, this is our MVP that we launched last week. It's still in its very tiny, tiny infancy. We have a very big job to do. And right now, you can see we only have two content areas. One of them is disability benefits, and the other, other is education benefits. So we've been working on getting this, this content that is currently pretty overwhelming and distributed and putting it in a very concise human language for people to search and find. So let's walk through one use case. Am I eligible for compensation? So if you're a veteran and you would like to know if you're eligible for disability compensation and you want to search for that, you could find this page on va.gov. And you would find a very, very long page, actually many pages that might answer your question. And there's a section about eligibility. Or you could go on to vets.gov, which we launched last week, and there's a very concise blue box that will say, are you eligible, who is covered, and how it works. This is a snippet from the former page. Um, I'll just read one part of it. You are eligible if you are at least 10% disabled by an injury or disease that was incurred in or aggravated during active duty or active duty or training or in an active duty training. Um, I don't really know what that means, um, but I guess I would apply and then wait a couple years and find out. Um, <laughs> this, this is a page from our new site, vets.gov. Um, are you eligible? Yes, if you became ill or were injured while you were in the military. Okay, I got it. Um, so another thing that, that we may have mentioned is that it's really important to have this level of air cover if you actually want to launch a tiny product that serves a tiny thing in government. Um, a tiny to be big. This is a quote from Secretary Bob from our initial blog post for vets.gov. We wanted to get vets.gov in front of you now as we build it so you can tell us what's working for you and what isn't. And this is core to our philosophy for how we will scale this product. We have user voice tickets. We have GitHub, which we're completely developing in the open. We do frequent usability sessions and user research. And we, if you are a veteran, we would love to talk to you about what you think about this. Um, so it's also core to keep in mind who we're serving and why. Um, these people deserve a lot of great services, and they deserve to get all the things that we have promised them. So thank you so much. And next, I would like to introduce Erica to talk about my USCIS. I'm Erica Deal, um, a designer and researcher at 18F, and I'm going to tell you about a project that we're working on with USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So after things like taxes and the weather, the USCIS website is one of the most visited government sites in the US. Every year, around 6 million people apply to USCIS for things like green cards, visas, and naturalization. But those millions of people aren't having a great user experience. So I know this firsthand because my husband and I went through the green card application process last year, and it was really frustrating and stressful for us. Our application got returned, it got suspended. At one point, we drove 200 miles to pay a special doctor about $400 in cash, and that was actually the easy part. Um, we really lost our trust in the process, and for about eight months, we felt incredibly vulnerable because what if it didn't work out and we couldn't live our lives together? So it did work out for us. Yay. Um, but there are literally millions of other people who are going through this experience every year. So I was excited to work on this project. Um, I, it was clear to me that the process needs to be improved and that doing so would have a huge impact. So here's what we heard when we started interviewing USCIS customers. We heard that users have a lot of questions. The USCIS website doesn't have clear answers, and when they call for help, they're left on hold for hours, and they still don't get the information that they're looking for. We also heard that preparing applications is really confusing. Forms are in convoluted language um, with really complicated instructions. 
For example, applying for a green card requires filling out seven forms that span 27 pages with 53 pages of instructions. Many users are so intimidated that they hire expensive immigration lawyers. We did. So finally, we heard that when users actually submit their applications, they're left waiting for months without a clear expectation of when they're going to hear back. There's a website where they can check on their status, but it's not very intuitive, and it doesn't give granular enough information for them to feel at ease. To add to the anxiety, many applications are suspended or returned, like ours was. So it's not very fun having your application sent back with a frightening intent to deny notice. Is it that USCIS wants to be frightening? Well, of course not. They want their customers to have a positive experience, and they're committed to improving the process. But they're facing a bunch of institutional challenges that are creating these problems for users. Um, sorry. So it was really under important for us to understand what was happening on the other side of the process. And here's what we heard. So employees are relying on legacy systems that just don't work very well. For example, when a customer submits a change of address form, a USCIS employee has to manually enter that information into multiple different databases. So when mistakes are made, important documents get lost in the mail. As a result, USCIS is receiving lots of calls, more than they have the capacity to respond to. So here we have a common UX problem a gap in understanding between users and the people serving them. We needed to take an existing process that was centered around forms, that was centered around forms, and help USCIS center it around customers. It's a subtle but important difference. It means that USCIS treat applicants like they're people, and that applicants feel like they're being treated like people. Of course, that's not a change that can happen overnight. It's taking a lot of work to build consensus, to align all the partners on a common vision, and to bring a bunch of legacy systems up to date. To tackle these issues, we ran a series of design studios with a bunch of designers, developers, and USCIS stakeholders, even a couple of their lawyers, to surface everyone's ideas, understand what was standing in our way, and start working toward a shared vision. During each studio, we built a prototype and then took it out to test and iterate on. So here are a few of the areas that we focused on. First, we needed to make the application process easier to understand and help answer users' questions. We started by reorganizing information um, to help users sort through the many options. So right now, they can enter their current immigration status and select what they're trying to do. And the site shows them what they're eligible for and how to apply. And to answer customers' questions, we built a search function with a growing repository of answers to frequently asked questions. We also created some simple search tools to help them find doctors, English and civics classes, and other resources that they might need during the process. The second area we looked at was simplifying the application itself. We built a simple online form for the application for naturalization with lots of tips and validations to help users through, and instructions in plain English. We're currently testing it with users to, um, and making some improvements before we offer it to the public. If we validate that the system's working, we'll extend the tool to other types of applications and offer it in multiple languages. Finally, the third area was how to turn an applicant from a series of forms into si a single account or story. In other words, a person. We're designing an account system so users can track these applications, see their notices and appointments in a single location, and find out what to expect next. So we've launched a first version of the help features, and we're gathering feedback and making some changes. And we're testing a prototype of the online application. Um, that's a photo from a session we facilitated in LA last week. So being lean in government isn't easy, but USCIS is starting to move toward a design culture that's more responsive to its customers' needs. And we're inching toward a smoother immigration experience that's more supportive of users so that we can help rebuild their trust in the process. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce Leah Bannon. Hi. 
Um, okay, so um, how does this thing work? Um, so FEC is one of our first projects at 18F. Uh, we've been working with them for about a year. Um, that's the Federal Election Commission. So their name makes them sound like they manage your voting or something in the United States, but they actually manage campaign finance data, money in politics, right? So every time you see anything about presidential, Senate, Congress, PACs, super PACs, raising money, spending money, that's all coming from this one agency. Um, that's their, their data. And um, journalists have built extensive parsers to handle that data and, and absorb it and organize it. But if you want it, this is the site you're going to. Um, and it looks like it was built around the beginning of the century, because it was. And if um, most of the people who have to use this on a regular basis have to kind of, they've memorized exactly where it is on the menus and they play like a game of operation to like get their mouse over to the page. Um, or they go to a transparency organization like Sunland Foundation or Open Secrets. So um, the FEC approached us about a year ago and they said that they wanted something that worked for the entire public from the campaign finance experts and the heavy data users to average citizens like you and me who just want to know on a random night where's my senator getting their money from. Um, they wanted to be the canonical source of data uh, you, they didn't want you to have to run around to different organizations to find that data, and they wanted modern technology. Um, so in close partnership with them, we launched a beta site a few weeks ago. Yay. But it, it took a year, thanks. Um, it took a year, so why did it take a year to get to a public beta? Uh, a lot of reasons. Um, first, those were the goals that they actually wanted, but when they came to us, what they asked for was a pretty website. Um, and so we had to spend a lot of time doing extensive user research and brainstorming and um, interviews uh, to get to those goals. Um, and we built a basic data site um, that let you kind of explore that basic campaign finance data, which is actually just one of many things that people need to do on that website. Um, and that also took a lot of time cleaning and organ reorganizing the data, um, which was originally similar to USCIS, organized around complicated government forms and jargon and not the information that people are looking for. Um, and they were nervous about the public launch for a lot of different reasons, and it wasn't just your average pre-launch nerves. The FEC has a bit of a tough time with the press. Um, so, uh, Fun fact, um, when the leader of this organization calls it incredibly dysfunctional and problematic, she's not talking about the 300 hardworking public servants who go to work every day and help users every day and deal with data. She's talking about the six commissioners who have to decide and agree, three Republicans and three Democrats who have to vote before they can do anything. Um, but everyone at that agency takes all of this bad press to heart and they, um, <laughs> the only federal employees who are more unhappy with their jobs handle toxic chemicals. Um, so they kept wanting more and more improvements and features to the site, and so I asked if we could release the APIs first. Um, we had spent all that time working on reorganizing and improving that data and building beautiful developer-friendly APIs because that we're an API-first shop. And, um, I asked if we could release it, and they said, sure, whatever. Most people don't even know what that means. Um, and that was our first iterative release, and that was back in July. And it went, it went really, really well. Um, the, there was an outpouring of support and excitement on Twitter, especially from people who use that data a lot. And um, the, not only had the FEC never gotten that much public fe positive feedback, they just had never literally gotten positive feedback before. They didn't, the, the comms people didn't have a file for it. Um, they, they were literally in tears. I mean, it was, I still get goosebumps talking about it because, I mean, these people work so hard and their CIO couldn't form sentences. He was just kind of randomly sputtering. Um, so after that, and adding a few more features to the beta site, we launched our beta site. Um, and now we get to constantly release and test new features without waiting for up and holding up for some big splashy public launch, which is something I've actually talked to Eric about. Um, 
There are about a million ways that you can get involved and share your feedback. Um, you can file issues and pull requests on GitHub. You can uh, fill out the form on every single page to submit feedback on every little page on that site. Or you can sign up for our weekly usability tests. Thank you. I'm going to give it back to Hillary if she's still around. Oh. This is a. This is just a, whoops, yeah, go back one slide because we want to tell a quick story. Uh, on Leah's team at 18F, this is Lindsay Young, and she gets nervous every time we show this because she says, it's not just me, and it's not. There's a whole amazing team that did this. But, but this is a great story because Lindsay uh, was a, a journalist. She was a reporter looking for that public data and, you know, combing around the FEC.gov website, combing around data.gov, downloading it, trying to figure out what to do with it. She didn't know what to do with it, so she learned to code. Uh, she, you know, took classes. Do what you do. You teach, teach yourself to code. You work hard at it. You learn from other people. Um, then she thought she heard about us. And she thought, well, maybe I'll go work for the government and try to do this stuff internally. So then she got to work on the project that built the API and then eventually built this open graph search for the FEC. So, you know, I, I wanted to end with this as a little bit of a call to action just to say uh, we are hiring. Um, you can see, uh, you can find things at both the, the White House website, uh, whitehouse.gov gov slash usds and also 18f.gsa.gov and if you want to hear a little bit more about we're going to take a deeper dive this afternoon just into how 18f and some of the different functions of our organization are operating as a lean startup uh, that's at 2 p.m thanks a lot thank you